Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session. Uh, there's a separate session. If you don't know, of course you know. Uh, it's the in-process in tracing above. This one is the GDB, GDB session. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about GDB's internal control C implementation. And by this, by this I mean uh, how GDB handles when the user types control C. And what does it do? It normally stops the program. That's the area of control C that I'm talking about. Uh, stop working? All right, I have to show this briefly. Yeah, all right, 10 minutes for you to all read that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, we did not cut that. <laughs> <laughs> Is this because I'm moving? Again? Yeah, I think it was when I was moving. Okay, it's good. So, yeah, uh, maybe just stay here. <laughs> so, what's this all about? Um, so basically, this is a, a year-long or maybe decade-long problem that uh, so in some cases, in some programs that you're debugging, it, your program is running and you try to interrupt it by pressing Control C and it just doesn't work, nothing happens. Um, and that, ha that happens when the program itself blocks SIGINT. Um, and uh, in some situations, you could do something else to stop the program, like send a signal from the, the shell, some other signal. Uh, but if the program blocks all signals, then you're stuck. Uh, and there's no way to get back the prompt. The only thing you can do is pray the program traps on a breakpoint or something, or just do you have to kill GDB. Um, so I'm going to explain why does that happen, uh, why that turned out to be important for the AMD GPU target, because this is something that I've known for many years that this was a problem, and I prototyped a fix for this, which it's basically the same solution, but it was just a, a prototype. Uh, and now that I'm working with AMD, well, good thing, because now I can actually fix it. Um, so, and to explain things, a uh, quick primer on the Unix process model. And I call this the, the rainbow slide, because I've put some color in, just because it's a wall of text. and. So the, the main things that I want to point out is sessions. Sessions are a way of grouping processes that they, sh they all share a terminal, uh, TDY terminal, basically call it the same thing. Um, and then a session contain, contains process groups. Which, uh, and then a process group, of, co of course, contains processes. So you have sessions, sessions contain process groups, and then process groups contain processes. Um, and then, um, this is all about job control. Uh, it's important for shells. Uh, but the important thing to realize here is that sessions can have foreground and background process groups. Uh, and when the way that interrupting or uh, a program that's running on a shell have, uh, works uh, it, on Unix is that you type some character on your terminal and the terminal driver thing in the kernel uh, understands that, okay, this character means it's an interrupt. So the kernel sends a SIGINT signal to your program. Actually, it sends it to all processes that, processes that belong to the foreground process group inside the session that has that terminal, right? Um, and everyone knows the control C character to do this, but you can actually change this. This is a, uh, something you can uh, configure uh, in your uh, terminal. Uh, and on, on shells, typically, you'll do something like this, and this changes the interrupt character to be control G. All right. Um, so this is an, a, a contrived example of a program that just blocks SIGBlock with SIGPROC masks. 
uh, blocks uh, SIGINT here. So it builds a, a mask with SIGINT and then uses this system call to tell the kernel, I don't want to see those signals. And it's falling. And you run this on the GDV, and this is what happens. Uh, basically, control C, and then nothing. This is what I was describing before. Um, another variant of this is if your program uses the SIGWAIT call. Uh, SIGWAIT is, sorry about this. Oh. It's quicker. Still broken. Um, all right, uh, moving on. Uh, so I was talking about SIGWAIT. <laughs> it's all on camera. <laughs> Is this candid camera? No? <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, so SIGWAIT is a special function that um, when you use this, you, you supposedly you block SIGINT, and then when the signal is sent to the process, instead of doing the normal, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the normal action of calling the signal handler or just doing nothing or aborting the, the process, uh, it picks up one of the pending signals and retrieves it from the pending list directly out of the kernel side. Uh, so technically, the signal is never considered delivered. Um, and this is like one of those old bugs. It was first reported to the GDB tracker in, in 2007. Uh, and I think there are older ones. Um, so the symptom is the same. Uh, we, we blocked SIGINT, and, or not the same, similar. Well, in this one, nothing happens. You get stuck. Here, uh, the signal reaches the program as this returns uh, success and the signal is stored in this variable, but it didn't manage to interrupt the program. It just continues running anyhow. Uh, but you know, uh, under the hood, the, the, the problem is the same. Um, the program blocked SIG and, and funny things, ha things happen. Um, so what is Control-C supposed to be under GDB? Um, I put this slide up because there was a little bit of a disagreement on this on the mailing list. Uh, this is my view, and um, so my view is that Control C has kind of a supervisor role in GDB, um, and the user thinks of Control C as meaning stop or pro pause the program. I mean, the user doesn't really think about in, um, send a SIGINT to the to the process, and the way I can prove this is that different uh, targets do different things to stop the process. Like on Windows, uh, you can see a sick, sick trap. Uh, if you attach to a process running elsewhere and then do, uh, you know, attach, uh, control C on some Unixes, you'll see just stopped. Doesn't say anything about SIGINT at all. Uh, it just happens that on Linux, the way it's implemented, uh, you get a SIGINT. Um, and another thing is that know that the default is not to pass SIGINT to the, to, the, to the process, so that it's already consistent with the view that you type Control-C, but you're not really intending the SIGINT to reach the, the target process. So GDB normally hides it from the, the process. You can change it with a handle command, but by default it's not, the, the setting is to not pass it. Um, of course, if you want to actually send a SIGINT to the process, you can. You can use the kill command on the shell or signal in GDB. This is a, this is a GDB command. It's like continue, but passes a signal. Um, all right. So why is it that sometimes if the program, well, all the time, if the program blocks the SIGINT, uh, why does it not work? It's a consequence of how GDB implements this. Um, 
This is a wall of text, and I can explain this with pictures. Um, I'll try to go back to see if I forget something. But uh, basically, GDB, when, it, when you type run, it forks execs, and the exec ends up spawning the shell, and then the shell execs again, and you end up with the inferior process running as a child of GDB. And this process is sharing the same terminal as GDB, the same terminal device. And remember, I mentioned before the, that sessions would be a way to group processes in Unix, processes that all share the same terminal. And so we have a session here. Uh, and then you can have foreground and, pro and background process groups. If we only have two processes, we can think of you know, a group with one process and a group with one process here. So let's skip process groups and think in terms of processes. So we can say that either this process is in the foreground or this process is in the foreground. And when the process is in, is in the foreground, they receive input and the signal signal. That's where the, the signal goes. So when GDB does this, it needs to juggle the terminal settings between both these programs. So when the inferior stop or you don't have one at all, input is going to GDB, it's processing CLI commands. When you type control C, there's nothing running, you either interrupt the current running command, like help, it's a lot of text, and you, you bore the type control C that aborts that command. Uh, or if you're running no command, it will, you'll see quit being written there uh, on the CLI. Um, and then when GDB, when you do continue, then GDB makes this guy be the foreground process, group foreground process, and then everything you type goes to that guy. When it stops for a breakpoint, juggle back. And when you do this, you need to um, change the terminal settings. Say, say this, this guy is a curses program, so it changed the, you know, the, the terminal flags to you know, raw mode or cooked mode or disabled echo, that some of those settings that you can do in terminals. And GDB uses readline, which has its own required settings. So when GDB uh, flips, whoever's in the foreground needs to save and restore those settings. Um, all right, so when the process is running, input is going, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's GDB. Uh, I guess this is repeating what I said before. Um, yeah, so basically when this guy is in the foreground, things go there. The second goes there. So there's a second handler inside GDB's code, and yeah, you know, does what you expect, sets a global flag, and then the GDB's event loop ends up doing something. Um, and uh, for those who've stared at GDB's code base a bit, you may have stumbled on this quit macro. So the signal handler sets a flag, because you can't do much in the signal handler. You have to be a sync signal safe. Um, and then you expect that the event loop will eventually react to that. But you, it may take a little bit to get to the event loop. You may be stuck in some command doing things in a loop, like reading symbols. And you want to interrupt that. So you've typed control C. That has set that flag. And then in spots in GDB that are running type loops, you'll have calls to this quit macro, which checks the flag. And if the flag is on, throws an exception. And that reaches out to the event loop again. Right. Uh, and so this was pretty much simple. Uh, this has newer levels. When this guy is in the foreground, you type control C here in the terminal, and now the signal is going to the foreground. Well, it always goes to the foreground, but this guy is now the, in the foreground. So this guy gets a second. Um, but because it's being debugged, it's running under ptrace. Um, ptrace intercepts every signal that happens in the process, giving the debugger, the ptracer, a chance to do things with the process. Uh, so the second, is the kernel sends a signal, or the terminal driver sends a signal uh, to this process, and ptrace interrupts it and immediately pauses that thread, the thread that was going to receive the signal. And ptrace then sends a sick child, a different signal to the ptracer, GDB, 
which reacts to this by calling this function call wait PID to fetch events out of the kernel. This then ret returns that this guy got a sigint. Um, and that's how GDB knows that this guy got a sigint. And then if you're in all stop mode, which is a default mode, GDB goes and stops all threads and eventually prints in the screen that program received sigint and does that juggling thing that I mentioned before. It saves the terminal settings of this guy, restores GDB settings, puts this guy in the foreground, and gives you the prompt. Right, so this is how it normally happens. And if you have SIGINT blocked in this program, the first two steps are the same, of course. The kernel sends the SIGINT into the process, but it remains pending because it's blocked. It's never going to be reaching the, the process. No signal handler is going to be called. Thus, ptrace never intercepts the signal because ptrace intercepts signals that are delivered. And this signal was never delivered. It was left pending. So you're stuck. And SIGWAIT is the same. Um, the signal remains pending. Uh, the difference is that the SIGWAIT function actually returns and the program can continue processing the, the SIGINT, the, the program you're debugging, sees that someone typed a SIGINT and processes it. But you were debugging, you would expect that that would stop the process, but it didn't because the signal goes from pending directly to user space. It doesn't go via the delivery code path in the kernel, so the signal was never delivered. So how do we fix this? Oh, before that, new slide. <laughs> so why is this important for AMD GPUs? I mentioned this before. Um, this is all that I'll be boring you with GPU stuff. Um, and it's just that we debug host threads at the same time as GPU threads. And imagine you have scheduler locking on. So when you type this command, everything is stopped. And now you're telling GDB, when I continue, I only want to resume the current thread, nothing else. I'm going to be focusing on that thread. So I select one GPU thread, thread five, and then continue. So Everything that's running is just a GPU thread. All the host threads are paused. They are in ptrace stop mode, or state, I should say. So when you type control C, remember uh, the terminal driver sends the SIGINT signal to the process that's in the foreground, which is that guy. It is in the foreground. The signal is in pending state, and then if something can dequeue it, then it becomes delivered. But all of the threads on the host side, they're all ptrace stopped, they're stopped. So they're never going to see the signal until you resume one of them. So what happens? You're stuck <laughs> because they're all stopped. You don't have the prompt. The prompt, it's as if you're, you're, you're stuck. You don't have the, you know, this parenthesis GTP thing. It's, you know, the, it's assuming the program is running. Type control C, this, the terminal drive is, has queued the signal already, so it doesn't, add more, but unless the GPU thread hits a breakpoint, you have to kill GDP because there's even no other way to send a signal to the GPU side because signals don't exist there. All right, so we need to fix this somehow um, because for the CPU side, it's, it's annoying, but people kind of work around it with sending signals from the shell because most of the times the program doesn't really block every signal, maybe you can find one signal that's unblocked, but for this case, it's basically stuck. So how do we fix this? We fix this how we fix every problem in computer science with, there's a question. Of course. It, uh, is there any other mic or is it just this one? I'll repeat it. It's like you've seen my other slides. Yes, it would. That would be a workaround. You'd start your program in, in a different terminal, and then you'd press Control-C in GDB's terminal. 
So in that situation, you have two terminals, not just one being shared by two processes. So that control C you type in GDB terminal will reach GDB and it will check, oh, I I'm debugging something and that something is in the foreground. So let me stop it. And it stops it in a different way for some targets. Was it? Oh, okay. Yes, you you can also try that. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah, maybe that will, will fix this one. I don't know why I didn't think about it. Yeah, I give up. I'm not going to be publishing this anymore. Uh, no, you, you can send signals directly to a process instead of a process group. So it might, might work. Might be a way to unblock this one. I don't remember why I tried it. didn't try this or something. Anyhow, <laughs> no one will, rem will remember to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, indirection. Um, so this is what we have. It's basically the same as I've showed before with more color. Um, and then the idea is to turn it in, into this. Uh, the difference is green is GDB's terminal, all in the same session. And the idea is to add indirection with a new terminal. So you would get what I was suggesting would be a workaround of starting process in a separate terminal. That's the, the main idea is GDB would fork and exact this process anyhow, but instead of making it share the same terminal as GDB, it would give it a, a new terminal. And the way to do that in Unix is use, using something called a pseudo terminal. And a pseudo terminal gives you two ends, and this is the nomenclature used by uh, open, open group. Um, so you have the slave end, which is for all purposes and intentions is a terminal to this guy. He sees a normal terminal. And then you have this end that this guy can use to control that terminal. Um, and because this guy has a separate terminal from GDB, that means that this guy can continue to be the foreground process group in its own terminal. So when I type control C, it will reach this guy first, always. And then GDB can decide what to do with that. Uh, so it's, it's basically decoupling. And this, of course, introduces complication to the code base hence this talk. Um, and you know, this means that whenever this guy uses printf, it goes to output in the terminal, it goes to this terminal, but this guy is not connected directly to an actual output device, it's connected to this one. So whatever's written here appears here. So GDB reads it and prints it to its own terminal. So it's like forwarding I.O. And when your program is running and it uses scanf, read input, whatever you type is typed in this terminal, so it reaches GDB, but it's meant to be sent to that guy. So GDB reads it, knows I'm debugging something, so I should forward whatever was read from the terminal and put it here, like marshalling. Right? Yes, that's what you have to do. Yes, yes. This is how SSH works. And when you ask it to create a terminal, this is how GNU screen works. Um, a, a, a what? Ah, you've seen my slides. <laughs> <laughs> the, the question was if, if we could use this to put the output in a TUI window or box.
so well you could but that's not friendly because the user does you might not even know that the program blocks again at some point all right so the idea is to make it work just just work you know with uppercase yep Yes, because in that situation, the process is going to be running on a separate terminal already, right? And yeah, and we don't do this forwarding. Whatever you type in GDB's terminal doesn't isn't forwarded to the attached process, but we could. The code that's added for this solution makes it possible to do that, and we could even do that for say remote debugging. We don't forward input typed in GDB terminal to the remote end, but we could. There's an, even a, a very old comment, in, comment inside GDB suggesting that, but no one ever did it. There was more questions, yeah? Uh, since you're not doing anything to the output of the process, would it be possible to no, because you don't want to mess with whatever the process does. You, you mean redirecting output? So this guy's control terminal would be this one, but the output would be redirected here. I guess. Uh, I guess it could work, but. Exactly. So there are there are advantages to having it this way, and to me, it's more decoupled, like without mixing two different terminals. I don't know whether the process being debugged is going to be confused because the control terminal yeah. is one thing and then STD out is something else. I, you know, I, I, don't, I want to be the least invasive pro possible. Um, I want them to debug their own problems, not ours. <laughs> um, right, so I basically already explained this. So when you type control C, it goes here always and then GDB just simply stops the process using some other, some way. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, yeah, IO forwarding, this is just text to explain what I've explained before, just the names of the, the POSIX functions that let you create a, a pseudo terminal. There's a dance you have to do, it's just not just one function. I mean, wh why would you do that? You have to do a bunch of things, like create a pseudo terminal and grant it and unlock it. Uh, doesn't matter for this talk. Um, and then GDB starts the process as if you had done TTY and then the name of the terminal. So, but internally, that's what GDB does. Um, and then GDB registers the, uh, the master end of the, of the PDY in its own event loop, so it can do this forwarding of, of IO. So here, these file descriptors, you can put them in event loop, which has a select call which wakes up whenever something is uh, sent to this guy or, or yeah. Um, and then this is, this is output, right? Uh, that's easy, like if, whenever something is written there, you wake up and select, fetch whatever is written on the master end of this to the terminal, print it to the GDB's own terminal, done. Uh, I input is a little bit more complicated because uh, you still have to consider the two different modes of um, am, is the user typing a GDB command or is the program running and I don't have the prompt. Um, so when, the, when you don't have the prompt, the program is running, you're going to be uh, copying whatever was written in GDB's terminal input, whatever you typed, you're supposed to go to the uh, inferior terminal, forward that, whatever keys you press, it goes to, G to the inferior terminal. When you do that, you need to copy those bytes pristine, 
with no terminal driver changes to you know, there, there's there's settings in the terminal that can convert automatically between you know slash slash r slash slash n to just slash n things like that and you don't want that you want every byte that goes to gdb's terminal to go raw to the other end other other end so you need to put gdb in that raw mode uh, and when the program is not running you put it in the mode that readline wants thankfully we already do this inside gdb there's a, uh, i mean we don't do that but we have all the spots that need to do that they already call this, this function give the terminal to the inferior or make it ours so we just need to do other things inside these functions when we when we have this uh, mode working um, so yeah um, funny thing is that running the test suite with this uh, runs into a funny use case that I noticed that um, there are some test cases that use run to run the program under GDB and then detach, assuming that the program continues running uh, in the background, which is kind of, you know, if you think about it, why would you do that? Um, if you run, you expect you just kill and then restart. Um, and uh, I was surprised to see that, but I only know this because the test started failing. Um, and so I thought it might be a good idea you never know what people do out there uh, to have a, an escape hatch to uh, go back to the old mode uh, because the old mode will still be there even if just for other Unix systems. Um, but I thought an, uh, an easy escape hatch would be to, if you set your terminal, when, when you do the, the TTY command in GDB, that's, the argument is the name of the terminal where the inferior is going to be running on. And in POSIX, POSIX has a number of files that they claim that always exist in all compliance systems. And one of them is slash dev slash, slash TDY. And this always means it's my terminal, my current terminal. Um, and so if the user does TTY or this thing or this longer version, uh, then this means that you really want that the inferior runs on my terminal, on the same one, which means go back to how it was before. The downside is that signet is blocked. There's no way to get, you know, unless you do the magic kill from the shell, you're stuck. Um, and, you know, having a special name in the setting instead of just making it like, if it's empty, then do the old thing. is better, in my opinion, because it means that the empty thing means do whatever is the default thing uh, for, for, for your system. Um, right. Um, so if we, if we do have this, then know that we have to forward input and input, output and input in both directions. But it also means that we can control when we do that. Um, it's GDB that has the, you know, the handle on when to do this. So one immediate thing that I realized was, oh, cool. So if, if you run your process in the background, that's what this means, and it starts printing stuff, and your terminal is set up such that it won't generate C, T, T, U, T, T, U, O, U, you know. Doesn't matter. <laughs> By default, that won't happen. Um, the output will be forwarded and it will be mixed with whatever you're, you're typing in GDB, which can be confusing. Um, and if we control it, then it's always separate. Uh, GDB output and then inferior output. Small thing, small detail. Not very important, but just something to, to remember. Um, but the good thing that we could do is that TUI thing, that since we can control when output is flushed, we could make the TUI forward the inferior output to uh, one of the TUI windows instead of how it's today, which is messy and breaks the TUI screen because TUI is curses and the inferior just outputs stuff to the screen and you, the end result is that the whole curses window just scrolls up or worse. 
and then you have to type control L to refresh if you know it. Uh, so if, if we hooked into this routine, which is the central routine that GTP uses whenever it wants to put things on the console window, uh, we could hook it, hook the output, forward it, instead of raw bytes to the screen, use to put S to print it uh, on that box, or even create a separate window just for inferior output. Um, the downside of doing that, well, first thing, this is something that occasionally uh, pops up on IRC, like, my tweet screen is messed up, how do I, why does this happen? And we explain it and teach people about control L and say, well, I'm sorry, that's just how it is. Uh, so we could fix that. The downside is that if you're debugging curses programs, something, some program that does something special to the terminal, then it will no, no longer do special things because the output will be printed in the window inside TUI, which doesn't understand uh, ANSI escape codes, uh, and will just print those raw escape codes. Have you seen, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen escape codes being printed on the screen, like uh, you know the, the carrot sign and then a bunch of random numbers. Those are magic escape sequences that have meaning to the terminal. And if you don't have, uh, um, if you don't have uh, a, a terminal emulator running, consuming those magic escape sequences, then it's just garbage. Uh, you know, and then a the funny thing would be if we did implement a terminal emulator inside the toy, that window, and then you could have toy inside the toy, inside the toy, inside the toy, turtles all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's, we wouldn't do this, I think, just funny to think about it. Um, so, uh, so we have this, if we did this to fix the um, naive users, and I'm using naive, maybe wrong word, but I didn't mean to uh, be uh, downputting, just someone who doesn't understand what's going on, uh, we would fix that with the downside that if you want to debug a curses program then it, and enable the TUI to debug it, you imagine, I do that all the time. It's debugging GDB using the TUI to debug, G, you know, my superior GDBs using the TUI mode, and I'm debugging an inferior GDB, and I enable the TUI mode. So I have two TUIs running at the same time, and this works perfectly today. So this would break it. And I think it's okay, because only GDB hackers do this. Um, so if you want to do that, either spawn your Curses program in a separate terminal, which is what sane people do, or you use the, the escape hatch. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Whew. All right, we're done, right? Except for one last problem. Um, so session leaders, remember sessions contain process groups and processes. Session leaders have magic properties. When the session leader exits, the kernel sends a sig hub to all the processes in the foreground process group. Remember, uh, you know, this hierarchy, I've mentioned this before, this is new. The first process in the process group, when you create the process group, becomes the process group leader. That's how it becomes a leader. The first process in the session becomes a session leader. There's nothing magical about creating the leader. It's just the first one becomes a leader. Um, right. So what this means is if you are debugging a program that forks, this guy is given a separate terminal from GDB. So GDB has terminal one. GDB created a separate terminal, and it's the slave end of terminal two. And this is guy you're debugging. And then this guy becomes a session leader of this terminal, because it was the first one. And we put it in the foreground so we can, you know, we put it in the foreground. And then this guy forks. You can do, you can follow it, continue debugging it using set follow fork, uh, no, set detach and fork off, for example. So you keep debugging both. 
and then the parent decides to exit. But this guy was the session leader. And I just explained to you, when the session leader exits, a CCOP is sent to everyone else. So this guy gets a CCOP, right? And processes normally aren't prepared for that, and the default action for CCOP is die. Not good. Um, so how do we fix this? Like in every, <laughs> within direction. <laughs> So we apply the double fork technique. It's something that, you know, standard in Unix to, to handle uh, sessions and terminal things. When you think about demons, they, well, in the old days, they would do them, this themselves to get rid of the control terminal. Nowadays, you have um, systemd doing this for them. Um, but basically, the idea is, well, my problem is that the first guy becomes a session leader and it can exit. So the solution is just to put someone in the middle that never exits, and that guy becomes a session leader. So my debug program doesn't have to see that problem anymore. So this is how normally GDB starts the process. It forks, so there are two, uh, and one and two are the terminals. Uh, no, sorry, are the processes. So process one, process two, fork, and then the child execs the shell, and we do this because we, you can pass arguments to the inferior, and you want shell globbing and variable expansion to happen, and you de delegate that to the shell. And then the shell execs your program, your inferior program, whatever you want to debug. So there's this dance going on behind the scenes. Um, and the problem was now that this guy became the session leader, so we add in direction, so we fork twice. So fork once as before, fork twice. This guy becomes a session leader. And now the shell, the same thing as here, shell execs, this guy execs the shell, the shell execs the inferior. And this guy becomes a session leader. So you end up with three processes instead of two. So it's an implementation detail that will be visible in PS, if you care. Um, so there are, Question? Uh, yes, and then it puts GDB in the foreground, creates a process group for GDB, puts it in the foreground. Yes, exactly. Right. So, yeah, this session leader stuff is all about shells. Um, so, uh, yeah, I thought I'd, I'd mention this because this might be surprising to people that will see this now. We have three processes. Um, so, what happens now is we have a new session leader. This guy exits, and it's not special. This guy continues running, so there's no sig hub anymore, and things work as before. Solved. Uh, of course, now we have to handle this guy. We have to keep it around. It's just a fork child of GDB. It has a really small loop that just waits until GDB wants to destroy the terminal. Um, and that's it. it could, the limitation of making it just a fork child is that this won't work with um, non-MMU systems because they only support v fork. We could, I didn't solve that. Uh, so for those systems, they will still use the old way. We could solve that by, by making this guy exec itself, like add a new command line switch to GDB, meaning GDB dash session, you know, go into session leader mode, just wait there forever, uh, and we'd solve that. And then we will be fork. Hmm? No. No, we can't. We can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, uh, I would have no control at all what it's doing. 
right? That's a good point. I could I should investigate if I can do it. So basically what I'm doing now is waiting for it, the child to exit, which is what the shell does. But I, that a, that's a good point. I could try to investigate that. Um, of course, then it wouldn't work if, if you do set startup with session off. With, sorry, startup with shell off. Then there's no shell. So we need this. Right. Um, right. So I mentioned the run plus detach problem before. And this is what, if we didn't have this double fork thing, what would happen is, um, you detach, and you're basically telling GDB, I don't care about the inferior anymore. So I'm going to destroy the shell that I created, you know, to the, the terminal. You've told me that you don't care about debugging this process anymore, so I'm going to destroy the, ter the terminal. And this guy is a session leader. It loses the terminal and gets a sick up and dies after you've detached it. Not good. So with the session leader in, GDB still destroys the terminal. But the session leader um, is a different guy, so there's no sig hub here. The downside is that you did run plus detach, you've detached the process, and the process that you detach no longer has a terminal. So whatever it prints goes nowhere. Uh, you're not debugging it anymore, so nothing is forwarding input and output. The, the terminal was destroyed. Uh, what happens is that the process continues running anyhow, and output goes nowhere. But I claim that this is okay. This run plus detach scenario is uncommon. And to me, to me, if you run and detach and expect output, that means you expect output to appear in GDB's terminal. So you should tell GDB that. And so we can do that workaround. And then the control C problem will not be important to you because you're probably attaching to the, uh, running the program tweaking some variable in memory and then detaching. Like some global setting, you're hacking the you process and then detaching. So you're just going to detach, so it doesn't matter what, how Control-C uh, works. So that's one downside, which I claim is OK. All right, we went all this way, and all such that we can get the SIG into GDB first, right? But we still need to stop that process somehow, right? And we can't just send a SIGIN to stop it because it's blocked. So we need to stop it in a different way, um, right? Uh, maybe it's clearer. Here, we have to implement this. So the SIGIN goes here, and then GDB decides, stop this guy. How? How can we stop a process that blocks all the signals? No, much simpler. We have six stop. Six stop is special. There is no way to block six, six stop. You can block all the signals, but six stop always works. There's no way to set up a handler for six stop. Your process never sees it ever. Um, the, so this is how GDB already stops processes internally. When you're saying in non-stop mode, and you use the interrupt command and then goes through each and every thread and sends a six stop to each of them. So we already have this code inside GDB. We were just not making use of this, use of it in this situation. Um, so now we can reuse it. There's even a target hook method called target stop. I don't know whether it's written there, no. Um, so uh, you will see a small difference uh, is that you type control C, GDB saw it, saw, got the SIGINT, decided to stop the process, and is no longer going to be stopping it with SIGINT, just going to do a pause, stop for no reason, just suspend the, the thread. So instead of getting this, you get this, which is already what you see with non-stop mode. Um, right, so if you really, really want to get the signal to your process, uh, sorry, the SIGINT to your process. You can still do it with the signal SIGINT or pass the SIGINT in the shell. Like, remember, I claim that control C is the supervisor thing, not really, when you type control C, you're not really thinking of, 
I want my program to see a SIG and, and run the SIG and handler normally. Um, right, so these are details how it's handled internally. Um, the interesting thing is we can do new things if we have this. So in all stop mode, all stop mode is the default when something happens in your process, hits a breakpoint, receives a signal, everything stops. All, all of it stops. Um, currently, without all this magic, the thread that GDB selects and presents to you as the thread that got the signal is whatever the whatever was the thread that uh, where the signal was delivered to. Uh, and if 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 you don't have signals blocked in your main thread, typically it's a main thread. Um, but with this, because we control the stopping process, we can stop everything and then pick which of the threads should be the selected one. And so we can uh, pick whatever was previously selected when before the user you know, did like step or next, say so next over sleep call and do control C. Now with this, we can present the stop in the same thread. So you, your focus will still, still be in the same spot. Small detail, but it's now possible. Uh, same thing in unstop mode, except well, we preserve the previous behavior of control C in unstop mode stops just one thread, that's what happens today, uh, just because the kernel sends a SIGINT to one of the threads and GDB presents that stop as a SIGINT stop and leaves everything else running because it's non-stop mode. But which thread gets a signal is up to the kernel. But with this, we can control which one of the threads gets stopped. Uh, we can select the, the one that was already selected. Uh, it's a little bit more user-friendly. But we could go beyond and do other things. So you're in non-stop mode and you type control C and because GDB has control of sees the SIG and first can decide to do whatever, it could decide to not stop anything at all, just give you the prompt again and everything continues running. That's one thing you could do. Uh, or we could do, second, or we could also stop everything in all stop mode if we want it or maybe we can make it a setting and the user decides. The point is just that we now have this flexibility. Nathan. Um, yeah. But in non-stop mode, you can also do forward, process, forward commands. Right, so if you do, uh, in the CLI, if you do like C ampersand, then you're right. The second will will reach GDB first. Uh, but if if you do control, uh, sorry, C enter, then GDB still does that. Put the inferior terminal settings how it wants and all of that. Uh, so the control C will still reach it first. Thank you. And that's basically it. Now status. Uh, it's been a long process, actually. I think I prototyped this back in 2019, and then it got frozen. Never happened. And then last year, I revamped it and posted to the list. Version one had some problems. It didn't it didn't handle that session leader problem. Uh, and during discussions, I realized you know eh, I can actually fix it, so I don't have to explain it in a manual or. You know, there's one downside left, uh, less or fewer. Uh, so I, I posted a V2. That's the latest version that I posted. So it's been over a year. Um, and I want to post it again soon. Uh, I'm trying to keep this at least once per year. <laughs> no, no, uh, all seriousness. Uh, I want to put, repost this again pretty soon. It's blocked because there's a little bit of work that I need to do. Uh, there, there was there was review comments in this version that I never had a chance to go back to. Um, some details around when you're debugging Emacs, but Emacs uses Control C for something else. So Emacs does that thing that I mentioned in in the beginning of changing the interrupt key to something else. It changes it to Control G. Uh, and I'm to, uh, so 
uh, person debugging Emacs expects that when they type control C, it will be a normal Emacs control C, control X, control C, control Q, whatever. It's just an action in Emacs. It doesn't expect a suspension. Um, but because now we always over override control C, what will happen is even though Emacs in its own terminal said, I want my interrupt key to be G, control C will still stop it. Um, and that's not very convenient, I was told. So I thought I'm going to be adding a new command, a new knob to GB to be able, so that the user can specify what is the supervisor key. So that uh, in um, Emacs's .gdb file, they, they can do set interrupt character G, and then Control C will start working normally again. And again, ten minutes, and done. Thank you. Questions? I'm not sure we have time. Uh, yeah. No, because it's invasive, and we want to go stream first and then fetch it down. Yeah. Thank you very much.